All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our discussion on student-generated OER, uh, tapping into cognitive surplus to support open pedagogy with our two special guests who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, today forms part of our monthly webinars of this uh, Open Educational Practices Special Interest Group on a gauntlet of different topics. And if you haven't met us before, we're a friendly bunch of folk um, uh, from Ascolite, and our community is diverse group that includes educational technologists, librarians, academics, um, teachers, and more. And apart from our webinars, we also meet once a month to connect with each other, share our practices, um, share tips and how we're tackling different problems. Uh, once a month, we put out the Open Educational Practices Digest, um, and it's a 360 degrees wrap of all things open education in Australasia, including the newest open textbooks and projects fresh off the press. Um, so I'm going to make a shameless pitch that you can get this email straight to your inbox and hear about our events by signing up on our website. Um, and if, uh, Ash, if you could paste our website into the chat, that'd be great. All right. Um, I want to recognise that our webinar is being held on the lands of many different First Nations lands, and I'm personally working on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and acknowledge them as traditional owners. And I want to pay respects to the elders past, present and future, especially in the university context, their contributions to centuries of diverse knowledge systems. And this is a lovely artwork of Bunjil, a creator deity in Indigenous mythology who often takes the form of a wedge-tailed eagle, and it was painted by Wurundjeri woman Judy Nicholson. All right, pretty excited to introduce our guest today, who I see as real um, open educational practices pioneers in Australasia, but of course they're far too modest to ever shout from the rooftops about that. I'll keep fairly brief. Uh, Maze is an educational technology specialist, um, learning designer and early career researcher, and she's currently working as the Learner Experience Design Manager at University of Technology, Sydney, UTS. And Seta Twalalale is a senior lecturer with the School of Education at University of Southern Queensland, and she specialises in intercultural education and teacher professional development. And she was introduced to uh, open assessment through a university grant program uh, a few years ago. Firstly, congrats to Mays and Aceta for publishing their insights in this uh, uh, wonderful paper in Education Sciences Journal. And we'll now start, well, soon start discussing this, but first we're going to use a Mentimeter to uh, introduce some of the key concepts. I will provide a link to that. Okay. Here is the Menti link. And should come up with a question about a key concept we'll be talking about, renewable assignments. I'll share my screen so we can see people's responses. So this is about how familiar are you of this concept of renewable assignments? So quite a few people have never heard of it. Um, about an equal amount have heard a little bit, and a small amount of people are quite familiar. So that's good to know. So we can make sure we explain that really well today. And then one more menti thing. Oh, you've already you've already all started answering this. Um, if you have heard of renewable assignments, do you want to share with you know, others in the webinar today, what are some features you associate with renewable assignments? Yep, so some people are saying 
not throwing away assignments, uh, making sure that student work is useful beyond um, the life of that immediate subject. Yep, activating student agency, co-designing with students, collaborating. Yeah, making sure they're not just forgotten never to be seen again, because some student work is really brilliant. Yep, associated with open education, published with the open license, that's super important. Great, I think those are really good features. And um, in a sec, I'll get uh, Mason Aseta to uh, introduce their, you know, why they wrote the paper and they can talk about, they can elaborate on these concepts a bit more. Yep, oh, that's a great one. Outputs from previous students' work that's shared openly can be built upon by the next cohort. Building the links between cohorts, I think that's that's really powerful. Okay, so... Now I will open it up to Mace. Um, and Mace, did you want to speak for a little bit about um, maybe provide a, sh a summary of your case study that you've written about in the paper and also why, why you wrote the paper in the first place? Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm uh, really humbled to be with uh, this wonderful group of people today and presenting our work um, with Eseta. So uh, a little bit. A bit of a background about where this is coming from. Um, first, this is really part of my PhD research, which I started back in 2011. Uh, yeah, a while ago. Uh, so, but this is um, the idea was really coming from my involvement um, and working at the Open University. Um, I was attracted to the idea of learning objects. Um, and I was curious at the same time about the whole idea of open educational resources particularly seeing what Massachusetts Institute of Technology does at their open courseware and the generosity of putting um, computer lectures just uh, freely on the internet. That was like a, a shocking moment for me at that time. Um, but then um, also observing other initiatives that were taking place and um, as part of the researchers looking at these initiatives and the main challenges, particularly around sustainability, a lot of projects actually um, stopped running because of many reasons. One of them, um, the um, lack of funding, uh, for example, but also uh, for the core reasons, there is there were no sustainable approach within these projects. Um, the other thing that probably is related is that uh, to to for me to start working in open education is uh, I taught for a while in uh, computing and information technology. So about five to six years and um, in different institutions. And I was marking assignments as many of you in this room have done or still doing. And um, I remember the amount of time we spent on designing assignments, putting feedback, um, handing it to students, but also about the time students invest on their assignments. So this is the 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 other idea. And sometimes I thought that uh, things can be done with these assignments. And we I've done a few things with my students at the Open University around uh, creating question banks. Um, when I started doing the research, um, I started learning about many things. One of them is the learning theory. Um, learning by teaching about generative learning constructivism we'll talk about this a little bit more open pedagogy wasn't a thing at that time but there was like an early stages talking about OER pedagogy um and a lot of the concepts coming from economy as well um like user generated content at that time web geo tools was the thing and um a lot of um research and work around cognitive um, uh, collective intelligence, but also I come across an idea which you see at the top of this paper, cognitive surplus, uh, which basically talks about um, the effects of the internet technologies on um, on our lives and on our social 
um, collaboration. This term was coined by, coined by a, a teacher and writer called Clay Shirky. Um, <clears throat> so this is really the background. Uh, one of the last two things I want to share is uh, I uh, maybe one of the beliefs that um, kind of drive this work. One is that I think I believe truly with the uh, um, this, uh, the idea that no one owns the knowledge and all knowledge should be a public good. So that's, I hope I did not take much time. I'll just uh, stop there and, um, and hand over back to you, Stephen. Thanks for that um, intro to your case study base. Um, uh, Aseda, how about you? Thanks, Stephen, and thanks to everyone who's um, made it here today. Um, it's a really a pleasure to be able to share practice with you. Now, I came to this from a completely different um, direction from Mace. Mace being an educational designer, I'm an academic. At the time that I stumbled across um, open education, I was just looking for grant funding. I was just trying to get money into my CV, and so this l &T grant came up. It was for this thing called open education. I'd never heard of it. And I went along to the information session and I got completely convinced by um, Adrian Stagg, now Dr. Adrian Stagg, um, who convinced me that it was a great thing. And I thought, hey, I can do this. And so I um, I applied. I did. I was lucky enough to get the grant because not a lot of people applied for that grant. Um, and so that's what really got me into the open education space um, and into doing renewable assignments with my students. So what um, when I was looking for models of how to do this sort of stuff, there were none, save for one A4 piece of paper that I'd stumbled across of Mesa's. And what it had was a description of what she'd done with her students. And I thought, oh, I want to do that with my students. So I'll show you what um, our what her model looked like and then how I built upon her model. Um, so I'll just share my screen here. Um, that's the right thing. Here we go. It's, hopefully you can see here, oh, sorry, this reduced uh, a very complicated looking model. Can you see that? So uh, Mesa's model is all the stuff in black. So you can see here that 99% of this model is Mesa's. She had come up with the learning design principles, um, how we build content with students, the process of review, refinement, and um, how we get to the end product, which is the open educational resource. Now, when I came along her work, to her work, I did not see this model. I um, read the summary of her work and just thought, oh, hey, looks great. And then I came up with the idea of adding professionals into um, the, the same sort of work that Mace was doing. Um, and lo and behold, what we ended up doing was basically what Mace had already mapped out for me. Um, and that's really what led me to writing this article with her was because I wanted to acknowledge that um, my work was not unique in and of itself. Um, it built upon the, the very thorough work that um, Mace had done prior. And another thing that brought me to doing renewable assignments as an open educational practice is uh, the work that I do in my, in my field. So I um, research intercultural education and I'm really looking at how we can make education more equitable for all learners. And um, when I dug deeper and deeper into the literature behind open, why do we do open? Why is it even a thing? It took me right back to human rights. It's a human right to have an education. It's a human right to be able to access knowledge. And so I'll just sh share with you quite briefly um, what really convinced me that this was something that, that I had to get on board with was that in the preamble to the United Nations Declaration on Open Educational Resources, it had in there all the rights that I fully believe in, um, what Mace has just mentioned about knowledge being a collective public good, um, that everyone's got the right to education, that everybody has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, including the right to share in scientific advancements and its benefits. So. Um, when I read about this idea of cognitive surplus, I thought, wow, why not? Why not harness all the knowledge that our students produce year on year? Why not harness that and direct it towards something that um, is useful to the public? 
So that's what led me to working with Mace on this paper. And I'm so proud that we actually managed to pull off the article <laughs> because uh, it came back with some, some reviews from people that didn't quite understand what we were trying to do. Um, but but we, you know, as you do, you hang in there, you keep at it, and, and we had success. So, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say about the case study for now, Stephen. Thanks so much for uh, both of your introductions. Um, we might do start a little bit of a deep dive into the paper. Um, early in your paper, you write sort of doing a literature review of existing articles on these topics, and you outline that there's um, a little bit of termino terminological confusion about what open education is, what are the different things that make it up. So maybe if we introduce that concept a bit um, and tease apart its things associated with it, um, you say in the paper, oh, we cite McNally and Christensen, and who argue that the term open is actually quite ambiguous and there's uh, not that much clarity about the relationships between open educational resources, which are openly licensed learning resources, open educational practices, which are more about, you know, the learning and teaching pedagogy, um, and open pedagogy. And they argue, as you cite them, they, they argue that um, this has obfuscated the main priority of OER, which is pedagogy. Um, did, did you want to... Either of you want to say a bit more about um, that? Oh, I'll, I'll tell it a bit, Yaseta, if that's okay. And um, please feel free to uh, build on the very few ideas. First, I think um, with when it comes to open education definitions in general, um, it's often, um, I would say, amalgamated into OER. So every time... Uh, you hear the term open pedagogy and um, or you say open education practices or OER pedagogy, what is perceived usually open education resources, OER. Um, making um, uh, and the whole purpose of pedagogy is, is not clear. It's not associated at all. So we all, always hear like free content, free resources. Um, but what actually we try to communicate is that it's more about making uh, educational resources freely available, yes, uh, but also encouraging collaboration, involving students in creation, sharing knowledge, um, hence creating more innovative ways uh, of, te of teaching. Uh, so this is like my two cents on that. Yeah, yes. so you're putting the emphasis on the teaching. Yep. Aseda? Oh, no. Um... I just wanted to add that that when you hear about open education, particularly if you're a novice, the term is deceptively simple in that you think you know what open means and you think you know what education means. But I'll tell you that I work in um, a school of education here with 76 staff and probably about five of us really know what open education and practice and open ed education means. Um, in terms of the rights, the licensing, and so on, because we've done projects in this area. So um, it's not a, a commonly um, understood um, area. And, and so it just requires a bit of a deep dive to get to, like I showed you, the why, and then the how is still a big blur for a lot of um, academics, because the how doesn't have many good models, that, which is another reason why we wrote the articles, just to sort of show here's the steps that you can take if you want to, to do what we call renewable assignments. Um, yeah, so, so pedagogy is important because we've got to remember the name of the what we're creating, they're called open educational resources. They are there to enhance learning, um, not just student learning as you might um, you know, associate with universities, but lifelong learning. That's a huge part of what the UN tries to promote, lifelong learning. And so these resources are to, are to help with that. Um, there's a really great article I read a couple of years ago about um, farmers in Africa who they just needed the knowledge. They just needed to knowledge to help them make the land that they were working arable. 
And so when these open educational resources came out, their production shot through the roof because they had that knowledge. So that's the value of open educational resources for community and for learning. Uh, and I think that's something that we've got to keep in mind and it'll link later to um, when Stephen talks about bringing professionals into our projects. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, uh, when, and there's a question for both of you, when you encounter your um, fellow lecturers and other teaching staff who don't really know what open education is, what, what's your sort of like, I don't know, elevator pitch to them in a way that if, you, if you're trying to appeal to um, how they want to improve their subjects or something like that or learning outcomes, what's your elevator pitch to them normally? Um, that's a good question, Stephen. I work uh, in, in learning design support at UTS and um, recently last year, um, I helped a group in UTS library on uh, producing a procedure for open access policy and we had to do interviews. Um, when every time we met with senior management, um, associate dean learning and teaching, uh, course directors, um, we paused to explain what open education resources are. So there was a bit of unclarity uh, at a senior level. But when working with academics, um, once you give them a very basic definition or give them some examples uh, of what these are, um, it just, yeah, encouragement and um, uh, curiosity uh, starts to appear. So um, the pitch really showing them what can be done, but also asking them a lot of questions about what they want. I remember I had a, a nursing academic who uh, came to me and we were talking about uh, helping him in his Canvas site. But he said, wouldn't it be great if all these academics at the School of uh, Nursing who create all these lectures, uh, just share them and put them in one place. And I said, yes, they're doing this in John Hopkins University, which is a project that stopped now. We know this one is not um, moving on any, but yeah, um, academics, they, I feel they're ready to do that, but it's just lack of awareness and uh, lack of clarity about uh, what these resources are, what is open pedagogy and how to integrate it into learning and teaching. But also it's on our end that we need to do a bit of more advocacy, a little bit more um, uh, professional development and events introducing uh, open education practices, but also showing how these can be integrated into learning and teaching, into the things that academics do, not necessarily adding extra load on what they're already doing, but showing them that you're doing it anyway, um, changing perspective of how you perceive what you do is all you need to do, really. Yeah, that's... That, that leads nicely, Mace, into what I wanted to talk about, which is from the academic perspective. So um, it, it doesn't take a lot of convincing. The elevator pitch is it helps with student engagement. It helps with graduate capabilities. And uh, it looks really good on your promotion applications. Okay, why? Because you're doing something. If you're doing renewable assignments, this is cutting edge stuff. This is stuff that not a lot of people are doing in Australia at the moment. All right. Or oh, sorry, or New Zealand, wherever you are. Um, this this is uh, um, it's a it's a practice that when Mace and I went to the OE Global Conference a couple of years ago, um, you know we put up an activity there and there weren't a lot of people that knew about what we were doing. Um, it, it's something that's very, I think, has a lot of potential, but just needs a lot more um, numbers behind it. And so again, I've done research into both student engagement the use of OEP for student engagement and the use of OEP for enhancing graduate attributes, which everybody, every university has, right? You want your graduates to come out with things like critical thinking skills, digital skills, um, being able to collaborate with others and so on. There's you know, usually a list of, I don't know, six or seven of them. And Renewable Assignments does all this for your students. I've done the research to show that and I presented at Aspelite uh, a year or two ago, um, showing the data behind this. Uh, so uh, there's definitely pros to, to the activity. There's also cons, but I won't talk about those yet. I don't want to rain on Stephen's breast <laughs> right now.
Well, great. Well, that actually perfectly leads into um, another part of your paper that's focused on the benefits of uh, doing stu student-generated content models, um, in particular for the students' learning and professional development. Um, so you highlight um, research into enhancements to students' learning and professional development, um, uh, especially for summative assessment, student satisfaction, uh, digital literacies, and something that stood out to me was their persistence and motivation to learn, which we know this is a quite a big struggle in higher education in Australia today. So I guess with that, that theme of what you're talking about, are you sort of saying um, the, I guess it's talking about the impact of open educational resources in quite a different way from um, from when people talk about textbook cost savings for students, that this is really going into benefits for the, the learning. And so are you saying that it's the co-creative process rather than the use of the resource itself freely, or, 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 is, or is it both that's the generative thing together? I'm not going to start here because I said it has a really excellent example on engaging professionals um, in co-creation. Um, so I said I'll, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> um, so it's both, Stephen. So it is both the um, co-creative process, but it's also um, the savings if you want to look at it from a fiscal point of view. I, I had a student, though, who at the end of his four-year education degree told me quite proudly he had never, ever in his whole degree purchased one single textbook. So for this student, textbook costs were not a thing. We also know that our libraries um, provide a lot of um, uh, textbooks for students. So the, the textbook argument, for me, it seems to have come from America, where it's been used quite a lot. But I mean, Mason, Stephen, I could be wrong. But I find that for my students uh, here at, um, I'm at the uh, mid-sized regional university where 75% of our students study online. For my university, the textbook uh, cost is not such a big issue because uh, we as um, lecturers make sure that we don't prescribe $200 textbooks. Uh, we're in education, we're not in law. So, you know, we make sure that our, our text uh, resources are affordable and accessible for our students. Um, and we know who our demographic is. So we teach, um, my university has a lot of mature age students and these days mature age means 25 years and above. Okay, so we've got a lot of part-time students, students who um, are in equity groups. So First Nation students, students with disabilities and so on. So it's not in the university's interest to be providing very expensive textbooks. So for this university, I don't think the textbook argument is one that would lead you to OEP. However, the um, the idea that students are co-creating to me is a very powerful one because our students, like I said, are mature. They've got lives, they've had lives before they come to study with us. They come with knowledge, they're not blank slates. So when we co-create things with them, they're using some of their background knowledge and previous expertise and they're bringing that to the table for their studies, which makes their studies more relevant for them. So I'll show you just some of the um, the comments that we got from students about um, the, the what they produce. So um, yeah, that's going there. So this was a book that we had produced um, for masters of guidance and counseling, masters of uh, learning and teaching, specialising in guidance and counselling. And um, it was a book called Hearts and Minds. You can see it up in the top right there. And you can see here amongst the comments, and I know there's a lot of them. I don't expect you to read all of them. I presented this at another conference. Um, it, the the People who responded to having their work shared, it was about community, about sharing their expertise. It was about just doing something different at university instead of writing an essay. You know, the, the they felt so happy to be asked to contribute something. And then when we did the research on graduate attributes, the students in the course were using what they had produced on their CVs for, um, you know, applications for their promotions and so on. So it just has benefits that kind of, go on and on so that they're not just doing a university assignment 
that I mark and nobody else sees. This is actually real world contribution here. Um, and when we talk about professionals, I'll talk about uh, quality resources and why that's important. Yeah, that sounds so powerful. And uh, from what you're both saying, a thing that's emerging is that, yeah, students are often existing professionals or already professionals or have worked somewhere in the world and have, I think, as Ash said in the chat, yeah, have prior learning and that uh, you're engaging them to use that, integrate it with whatever new thing that they're learning uh, and that sharing with others, uh, that sort of stuff is valuable. So that's great. Um, there is a question from James Neal. What editing platforms are suggested for developing renewable assignments? Do you have any suggestions? This one's for you, Mace. Um, for the group of students that I was working with, uh, it was basically um, a selection of their own. Uh, WordPress was like a recommended one, but it also depends on the type of students. Um, it, I think that was a recommendation for um, year three students. Uh, for year one student, um, in the research, we talk about different um, content authoring tools, and it was left as a form of autonomy for students to pick the tool that they wanted. Um, and um, for generating open textbooks, for example, um, there are some more uh, specialized tools like Pressbooks, uh, which is a great tool for creating open textbooks, uh, but really... Um, any content authoring tool would work. Um, the other thing that is important uh, through that experiment with the students is building that capacity for students, giving them and not assuming they're digital natives. This is uh, something that we often um, fall into and uh, ensure that there is enough scaffolding on the use of technologies, but also the understanding of the use of the licenses that they associate the final product with, uh, particularly Creative Commons. So there are two things there. So the um, the tools that are available, and now we are probably, and in addition to what we used to have, now we've got generative AI tools. And there are a lot of considerations, also from open education perspective about the use of the content generated from these tools and the um, the ethical consideration, particularly, um, given there's no clear the guidelines yet. And um, and on the other hand, understanding the licenses that they can use. So two things really need, they need to work with. Yeah, great. Um, you've both mentioned the <clears throat> involvement of professionals who are already in the workplace and capacity to involve um, practitioners, uh, clinical settings or whatever it might be into the OER development process. Um, and I'm just going to share the diagram, especially focusing on this blue part, the professionals being added into the process. Um, and in your paper, yeah, you, you talk about extending uh, the evaluation of the OER to include professionals outside the university, in-service educators, for example, um, and their involvement in the feedback, quality assurance of the resource, um, but also the technical uh, or workplace expertise beyond that that possessed by academics. Um, so did you want to um, speak more to the benefits of involving workplace or clinical professionals, practitioners into OER development? <laughs> yeah, thanks. So um, for those of you who have got industry-aligned degrees, um, you'll know that what we do is very closely aligned to real world applications. We get accredited by um, specific authoritative bodies and we need to be working hand in hand with all these organizations working together. So I'm here in Australia, a senior lecturer in early childhood and we have two um, authorities that have oversight over our degrees. Now, when we look at the early childhood profession as a whole, um, there's a lot of 
issues with professional development. So I wanted to address those issues, you know, wherever I could. Um, and at the same time, I wanted to do a renewable assignment for my students. So in my head, I came up with this sort of, um, imagine two circles, you know, a Venn diagram, say, and on one side are the educators and what their needs are. And then on the other side are students and what their needs and wants are. And in the middle would be the renewable assignments. That's how I sort of saw it working, right? Because one of the key uh, concerns about open educational resources, and you'll see this in the literature across the world, is its quality. We want to make sure that it actually um, has got quality because there's no point us openly licensing knowledge that isn't good. It's not you know, well-researched or it's outdated and, and so on. And so um, what I wanted to do was to have a professional development session with educators and hear from them directly. What is it that you need? Because I didn't want to create something for my students that isn't needed, right? The last thing we need in this world, this very digitally connected world, is more stuff online. I wanted to make something people would would actually use. And so um, we held that event that I'm talking about. Um, that became the um, sort of stimulus for the assignment that I did with my students. So on the left there, you'll see the event. And on the right, we actually co collected their concerns through um, uh, talking with the educators. We took quotes directly from what they said to us. And those became the concerns that my students responded to. So if the concern was, for example, look, we don't have enough information for children um, from culturally diverse backgrounds uh, about lunchboxes in schools, then my students were going to create that, right? So that was the idea. Now, um, it worked out quite well in that uh, a lot of the students that I teach are already working in early childhood centres, so they know these concerns are current. And um, they created the resources that were really specific to, you know, their, their own teaching context. So you could see there that there was a really close connection between what the professionals wanted and what the students produced. But the final step of it, which is what I got from Mesa's uh, model, was to go back to the professionals and hand them these resources and say, hey, have a look. Did this match? Did this meet your expectations and match your needs? And so um, that's what that diagram shows, is that professionals are there to help uh, gauge the quality of the resources that you uh, produce with students. Of course, you're there as the, the teacher, the lecturer, the tutor, but just having that independent pair of eyes on your work um, helps and it, it can form a cycle that can carry on. So I've done this work with four different cohorts of students and with two of those cohorts, um, we, we took the resources back, built upon what the educators fed to us and then we you know, did the, did the uh, round of activities again. So I think it's really important to stay in touch with your industry, uh, whoever that might be. And I know um, some great works come out of Stevens University with the Making Public Histories, a textbook there. Um, and again, written by teachers for teachers. You know, what else could you ask for? These are people who are in the field, know, know what they want and have got the time to do the research to go behind that resource. That is what I would consider a quality resource. So, um, I think that's where the, the value of having, it might not be profession, by the way, it might be community members. Like let's say you're doing something for First Nations or Maori people, and you, you've got to have that community buy-in. You can't just be creating it with your you and your students. You've got to have, you know, people from the community representing. Um, so yeah, um, community or professional uh, members can help make your OER quality resources. Thanks, that's, that's really useful. Um... I know there's quite a few people in this webinar who are teaching staff or educational designers. And so maybe if we, before we open up for questions um, broadly, um, you did discuss in the paper the role of the course facilitator um, in doing things like mediating the knowledge, um, curating the openly published resources in a centralised way, um, and being the more knowledgeable other um, scaffolding, et cetera. Did, did you want to uh, speak to that role um, and whether in participating in that, whether it sort of reflected back on your identities as educators or how you do, how you, how you do or think about learning and teaching? Um, 
I'll, I'll add a, a few ideas, etc., and I'll hand over to you because you're a recent educator than I am. Um, at that time, I felt that um, I had a lot of responsibilities to make sure that my students are well scaffolded with that knowledge. It's, it was new to them and it was an experiment. It was part of research. So I had a lot of responsibility to ensure that students have enough information. But also um, I noticed that the excitement that I had to um, be part of the co-creation process with these students um, and be able to guide them and be able to um, uh, to help them align with um, kind of the assessment criteria. Uh, that was that was very exciting for me. But moving fast forward to what I'm doing now as a learning designer, if I can use this term now, um, I'm still doing facilitation. I'm still coordinating work with academics rather than students. And as much as we have cognitive surplus in the classroom, we also have cognitive surplus in the teaching space. And academics have a lot of teaching ideas. So I borrow on those um, ideas that I developed in that model to harness that cognitive surplus in this classroom to um, harnessing the cognitive surplus that happens in the teaching. So how academics uh, teach and often we don't hear about these creative teaching ways and help them and facilitate um, a process of reshaping their teaching approaches into a reusable OER. So having the academics now as the students, as a, a parallel to that model, um, is kind of an example of what I do currently. Uh, but in the classroom, as I mentioned, it was like, uh, make sure that uh, there's enough scaffolding for the students in the, in the, uh, the process. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's the role of the course facilitator and coordinator is um, essential because you need to understand what open is so that when your students come to your questions, you can fully answer them. And when I first ran my project, I didn't have all the answers. I was still learning myself. And um, so it helps to have a team of people behind you to help you do that, um, that, that knowledge work because at my university, I'm really lucky to have a strong open education team. And without them, I probably wouldn't have been able to do the projects that I did. Um, the course coordinator, I, I don't know what even anyone else's experience is, but for myself, sometimes I feel like the students just get churned through the courses, right? They just get churned through. I might see a student in first year, I might not see them again until fourth year if they make it. Um, I, I don't have as deep a relationship with my students as I would like, given that most of uh, my courses are online. Now, with an activity like renewable assignments my students were publishing after they left my course so they had done the assignment passed the course and then they got invited to um, openly publish so that sort of extended the relationship we had because we could uh, work together further if they chose to no, nobody had to publish um, and and so it did sort of change my mind about the way we do assessment at university now I know that a lot of universities are grappling with things like artificial intelligence and whether that um, will, well, it probably already has affected a lot of people's um, assessments of their students' work. When you're doing something that's uh, very hands-on and you're, as a student, you're saying, here's my work, publish it. And as a, a, a course coordinator, you're saying to that student, yes, let's put that out there for the world. There's an extra level of... Um, of what's the word uh there's an extra level of uh, an extra standard that you've got to meet to actually release that into the world confidently and so this speaks to things like plagiarism academic integrity um and you know the depth of research that you need to go to to actually produce something that you're willing to release into the globe <laughs> that you can stand by and you've got your name on Okay, so so I think that that's one of the benefits of the projects that I did. My students were proud to say, this is my work. And so there's no artificial intelligence generating that work. This was their words coming out of their hands onto their keyboards. So to me, um, those sorts of activities are probably the future for assessment, given that we are finding the onslaught of artificial intelligence just a little bit too much to cope with, at least in my university. Stephen, if I can add also to what yeah. I was saying um, in terms of um, 
students publishing their work and the idea that uh, they probably extra careful with the quality of the content that they get outside and with their names attached to them. Um, and, and also this um, kind of aligns really nicely with the, um, the literature review that I've done for this research. And one of the things that I come across is uh, why people share. What are the incentives behind sharing content on the internet? Uh, Dichi and uh, Shirky talked about this a lot, and they, these references in the paper as well. But what they say basically is that the reasons behind why people choose to share, um, concluding that intrinsic mo motivations such as autonomy, competency, um, being connected, uh, and the act of generosity is the real drivers behind uh, cognitive tasks. So when it comes to cognitive tasks, mental processing and the output of that, generally based on research, human derived by these intrinsic motives. Uh, contrary to um, um, tasks that require muscles, <laughs> Uh, people usually derived by extrinsic motives. Uh, this is, of course, not to um, generalize on everything, but um, as um, some of the findings from research done uh, in, in in military and other areas, um, and sorry, and on why people share on the internet, usually, uh, and and that's what one of the things that probably we are uh, specifically uh, claiming that students want to share, students would like to share, and this model actually works in in the teaching um, uh, space. So relying on these intrinsic motives to encourage the students. Not all of them want to share, as I said, I said, my students, not all of them wanted to share. And we found out that those who were reluctant about the quality of their work did not want to share, but those who were confident with the quality of the content, they actually said, yes, I want to share it uh, with this license. And uh, that can sort of um, uh, aligned with what's in their literature. Mm, right. So what I'm hearing is the act of creating something that's going to be shared activates intrinsic, more more intrinsic motivation. Which, I mean, I, having talked to so many academics, I I know a big struggle for them is basically that a lot of students maybe only have e extrinsic motivation partly because of the structure of the course or partly because of how society thinks of education now. So that seems like a very powerful self to to that problem. Um, selfishly, I want to quickly ask, I think, Maze in particular, in your article you mentioned that the student-generated OER become course resources for future cohorts. And I'm wondering if you do that in a particular way. Do you do learning activities around the previous cohorts student generated OER or, or do you just put it on the reading list? How do you yeah, how do you think about it? Um, part of it for students to see what previous students have done. Uh, but it's not only um uh, on um on summative assessments. It's also uh, tied to formative assessments. So students can still do uh, student generated OERs on summative assessments, for example, generating uh, question banks. And that's become like a, a pool for students, uh, sorry, for um, for students probably to um, train or uh, for study uh, references, but also for academics. Um, we tend to create in learning measurement system, we tend to rely on quizzing tools and often creating a quiz is a time consuming process. So having a pool of student generated questions is something that can be kind of utilized not only by students themselves, but also by the teacher. Uh, so this is like one of the variations of what that could look like in the um, in the classroom. I like, I like how creative that is. That that's fantastic. Um, does any anyone in uh, who's attending today want to ask a question? Feel free to either um, open up your mic or put a question in the chat. Uh, Claire Baumer, go for it. Yeah, so um, I come from being a teacher 
as well, you know, primary, yeah, primary and that sort of area. And a lot of how you actually work is sharing resources. And my colleagues that struggled maybe a little bit kind of, yeah, there was quite a bit of different my different mindsets out there. And I think the people that succeeded were the ones that were happy to share and exchange ideas. And then you could co-teach and collaborate and all these lovely things. So I wonder if there's much kind of, I guess I'm just, I'm just it's maybe more, more of a, com a comment than thinking about how this actually, the process prepares them for being better professionals. And I wonder if that's been measured anywhere, but yeah. But yeah, thanks for your comment, Claire. Um, so the second project that I did um, was specifically just on teachers and their graduate attributes they gained from our degrees. And so those the list of things that I had said before, these it's a list that my university has, which every university has, uh, that'd be called graduate capabilities or graduate attributes or something along those lines. Um, so for my students, um, having to work with different software always will enhance their you know um, ICT knowledge. Um, as Mace mentioned, we have an assumption that just because people are born into technology that they know how to use it, they don't. You know, we've got to scaffold them with some of those technologies, particularly the ones that we want to use in our profession. Um, things like uh, collaboration. So um, working with, so with our um, uh, professional development session we had with educators, we actually had our students involved in that as well. So there was just this, this idea that, you know, I'm part of this profession, even though they were still pre-service. Um, so those are the sorts of things that you'll learn. The critical thread of thinking, of course, the um, academic presentation of, of work and so on. Uh, so many different skills, I think, play into this one activity, which is why um, I, I advocated for it, you know, for the purposes of, of student engagement and, and graduate capabilities. Um, and like you say, resource sharing is something we do in education anyway. So why not formalise it and slap an open licence on it so that our teachers are not downloading things from teachers.com or, you know, any of those other sites where they're just getting generic stuff that they're paying for when we know, you know, we've got the capabilities and the knowledge to create those resources ourselves for, for everyone. Yeah, but a really good observation, Claire. Yeah, thanks, Claire, for that question. Um, maybe... We are running out of time, but James Neal has asked a good question for maybe for us to finish on, which is um, uh, he loves the endeavour towards getting students involved in OER creation. And so what's what next? What are the future directions? So maybe either future directions in terms of themes discussed in this paper, or are there other things you're working on that uh, speak to these things? Oh, thank you for that question, um, James. I think one of the uh, future directions maybe is to start talking about open educational resources in different platforms. So uh, often I hear about open education in the library. We've got a fantastic group of librarians in the room today, and they also are knowledgeable about open educational resources. But often I don't feel the same uh, excitement when it comes to learning designers or other forms of third space practitioner. Uh, it's That energy is usually in the library and libraries have been leading this for a long time. But I feel, as Adrienne Stagel will say, it's everyone's business. Um, and we, yeah, chip in uh, from different places because it will be amazing to see how things can look differently and how creative ideas can come up from, from these uh, new areas. So that's just my two cents. Yeah, thanks, James, for asking that question. Um, funnily enough, Richard, who's put a comment just under yours in the chat, I think has the hint for the next directions. We need to hear from students who are in places or in situations that we don't have a lot of knowledge about. So one thing that, um, again, Adrian taught me was that it's not just about um, sharing our knowledge that way, it's about getting knowledge the other way as well. So um, we have a lot of uh, teachers, for example, who want to do, who want to embed Indigenous perspectives in, in their curriculum, but they don't have local Indigenous perspectives that they can draw from. We've drawn upon um, the New South Wales framework called the Eight Ways of Learning. It's been sort of taken across Australia, but Queensland 
we're at the state where I'm teaching and we actually have our own um, ways of knowing and, and doing. So um, getting that local knowledge out there, like Richard has pointed out, uh, would be really helpful, I think, for the next steps, particularly in Australia where um, these issues are, are you know, gaining more and more importance. Yeah, and uh, thanks for that. And uh, a few other comments in the chat that Fiona Carroll says she used Peerwise some years ago for generating uh, multiple choice questions, but found it difficult to get buy-in from students. So thinking about the value of creating questions as a learning tool recently and inspired to, yeah, maybe try that with um, students as the generators, perhaps. Um, so we've hit one o'clock. Um, I really want to thank uh, Maze and Aseta for your generous time and your insights. And yeah, congrats again on publishing the article. And uh, we look forward to more future publications from from you when you get around to it. So if everyone can, please thank our, our guest speakers. And uh, yes, keep, keep your eyes on the OEP SIG website. You can... Uh, find out about our next events. I'll just uh, put the link in the chat again if you want to get those emails. Thanks, everyone, and uh, see you next time. Thank you.